In the U.S. movement now, we don't have to spend much time explaining to people that there is horrific cruelty in the food system. Instead, we have to tackle more practical challenges like how do you get protein? And, and while that sucks, it's a big step forward from the moral discussion. For human rights, it's taken centuries um, to get uh, people of color and, and women uh, viewed as what we call legal persons. But if we look at technological change, that can be much, much faster. I think by 2050, we'll have the majority of meat, dairy, and eggs in high-income countries be animal-free, either plant-based or, or clean. And so my presentation is on the end of animal farming. Um, my background is with this think tank that we co-founded last year um, called Sentience Institute. We're focused on expanding humanity's moral circle in general, um, but the biggest frontier right now of the moral circle, I think, is um, animals used for food. So that's our main research focus, though we're keeping a mind towards both previous expansions in the moral circle. You know, we've studied things like uh, the British anti-slavery movement, which was arguably the, the progenitor of kind of all modern rights movements, all the way to thinking in, in the long-term future, which I'll talk, about at the, uh, uh, talk a bit about at the end of the presentation, with groups like uh, wild animals or insects um, who don't get as much attention today. Um, the culmination of, of much of the research I've done and others have done in this field um, is this book, The End of Animal Farming, that's coming out in less than two months now. And this presentation is going to um, present some of the ideas in the book, though in a bit different way um, than how they're presented in that. So uh, my background is very much in effective altruism. Um, I didn't start out as a vegan. I didn't start out as an animal rights activist. Instead, I was just focused broadly on how to do the most good in the world. Um, but I realized through you know, crunching the numbers essentially that um, if you want to help others as much as possible, then given the evidence of animal sentience and given the huge number of animals used um, and the way that they're treated and, and all of that, um, it was where I could do the most good personally. So I want to start this off by talking about where we are now. Um, you know, we talk a lot about um, the, the issues of, of factory farming or the issues of animal exploitation, um, but we don't often think too much about um, how they came to be and, and kind of what their internal structure is. Um, so what we now recognize as factory farming basically emerged in the beginning of the 1900s in the United States. So you had an increasingly urbanized population that was being fed with a rural food system. Um, a rural food system was one where most people were growing their own food, shipping at small distances at most, and it wasn't prepared to feed um, the growing urban centers of the United States. Um, so you saw a lot of food shortages. In fact, in 1910, there was a national meat boycott um, due to high prices and, and the unstable supply. Then, of course, when the World War broke out, you had a struggle to feed the troops. And growing the food supply as efficiently as possible um, became a real national priority for the United States um, and for other countries. So unfortunately, since there was virtually no animal rights activism at the time, or at least it wasn't very popular, um, you saw an increasing industrialization of the use of animals for food. So the first uh, factory farm is usually thought of as Mrs. Wilmer Steele's broiler house in Delaware in the United States. Um, she had, in 1923, uh, 500 chickens in her flock, but then she realized that she could um, produce you know, the meat that, that she wanted, the meat that there was such demand for, um, much more efficiently, you know, efficiently, of course, in, in the economic sense. Um, so by 1926, she had 10,000 chickens in her flock, um, and she kind of informed the rest of the farming community that, oh, wow, you can do this, you can confine the animals, they can still survive, they can still produce the meat. Of course, she wasn't really thinking about their welfare, um, but in terms of just getting the, the raw materials, the output that she needed, you could do it much more efficiently. So over the next few decades, with the use of antibiotics, for example, that allowed you to confine animals more closely without a prohibitive increase in disease transmission, with um, other factors like the verticalization of the industry, um, you saw kind of factory farming take over um, each specific um, animal. So, so first for chickens, um, of course for fish, with fish farming, virtually all fish farming has always been factory farming because they're aquatic animals, um, then pigs later, and then, and then cows uh, finally, um, and other ruminants and you know, in different countries. This has taken a longer time. It took a longer time in Europe. Um, but as of the, the 2000s, essentially, almost every country, including China and India, um, is primarily using uh, factory farming methods. So that's kind of um, what we're dealing with right now. And of course, in, in the past few decades, we've seen an animal rights movement emerge. 
So if you had to, to in, in a kind of generalization and an oversimplification, say what the animal rights movement has been up to, I think it's mostly been this. Um, so it's mostly been uh, protests, but particularly um, activism calling for individual diet change. So go green, go vegan, go vegetarian, reduce your meat consumption, all, all of that host of things, um, often on the back of undercover investigations or scientific reports that are showing animal cruelty or environmental destruction. But it's mostly been around creating a stable and, and, and growing somewhat minority of vegetarians and vegans. Um, unfortunately, this hasn't produced as much change as, as people hoped. So um, in the, if, you, if we ask US residents um, in surveys whether they identify as vegan or vegetarian, the numbers went from around uh, half a percent and uh, one percent, half a percent vegetarian, one percent vegan, to around today um, three percent vegan and six percent vegetarian. Um, and that's of course self-identification. The number of people who actually follow through with that diet is much, much smaller. Um, but those numbers have stayed the same from around uh, 2008 to 2010 onwards. Um, despite there being much more of, of, of this sort of activism, much more of these uh, veggie burgers. Um, you know, a lot of the, the plant-based food so far has been very vegetable-centric and, and very healthy and, and very organic, um, and all these things that uh, we in this room really love and, and, and love to eat ourselves, but they haven't been meat. They haven't been dairy or eggs by any stretch of the imagination. Nobody would mistake, you know, a, a bean and vegetable burger um, for a burger made from animal flesh, um, and I think that's unfortunately um, kept the movement from growing to a large extent. So where are we going? Um, as Martin mentioned, the big focus um, I have is, is technology. Um, so since 2008 to 2010, um, the movement has largely stagnated. Um, and, and in fact, if you look at global consumption of animal products, uh, that's of course increased um, due largely to uh, mid-income countries that are increasing their, their meat consumption. Um, uh, part of my reason for focus on for focus on food technology is that this is the animal rights conference, and most people are focused on social change. Whereas, if you look at kind of the the track record of the expansion of humanity's moral circle, um, technology has played a, an equal, if not larger, role than than activism in creating changes in attitudes and, and changes in behavior. So the big thing, of course, is this burger, the Impossible Burger. Um, so it's made from plants, despite looking so meaty. Um, it's very popular in the United States now, it gets a lot of media attention, it's getting into more and more restaurants, um, but it's made entirely from, from plant materials. Um, so it's made from things like uh, wheat and potato and of course coconut oil, which we know is kind of the saturated fat of the plant kingdom. Um, it's made with a lot less energy, with a lot le fewer greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so it's been supported in general by a lot of society, even not those focused on animal rights, and it's really satiating the, the carnivorous tastes of society. Um, it's pretty expensive now still. Um, if you go to Bear Burger, for example, where I'm based in New York City now, um, it's about $4 more, um, roughly four euros more than um, the animal-based burgers that they serve. You've had other companies doing this as well, um, like uh, Hungry Planet, which people don't hear as much about. Hungry Planet is doing the same kind of um, meat burger made from plants strategy, um, but they're not seeking out media attention. They're not as focused on the technology. Instead, they're really displacing a lot of um, burgers and other animal products in middle America. Um, so that's also really important as well. Um, but I want to talk a bit about Beyond Meat. So this is the competitor of Impossible Foods, um, a collaborator you could say as well, but also producing a, a plant-based burger. Um, so this guy, Ethan Brown, started the company in 2009. Um, before that, he had worked 10 years at a fuel cell company. Um, he was very interested in energy and the environment, um, but his father was a philosopher, and he was thinking a lot about animal rights too. So when he started investing in some vegetarian restaurants, he realized what a capacity there was for plant-based food technology that really hadn't been explored yet. Um, so he started talking to uh, Fu Hong She, um, a food scientist from Taiwan who did a lot of the pioneering research uh, in plant-based meat technology. Um, and I want to talk a little about exactly how this works. So the main way to produce meat from plants is through extrusion. Um, this big container takes uh, animal ingredients, or sorry, plant ingredients in the top, um, mixes them together, and then pushes them through with, with heating and cooling um, through this kind of long tube to, to almost stretch and pull them into something that's similar to muscle fibers that come from an animal. Um, so the end product looks something like this. Um, these are the chicken strips of Beyond Meat, um, but before they're kind of cut into individual strips, it looks kind of like a long tube. Um, but it's, it's sinewy, it's fibrous um, in, a, in a 
way that you can't really get in the plant kingdom. Of course, there are some foods like um, jackfruit that have kind of a fibrous texture, um, but they don't have the meatiness. They're not full of the protein and the fat that consumers are really seeking. So this has been really powerful and, and really compelling for a lot of people. Um, in 2013, when these chicken strips first came out, they were a huge success. Um, in fact, I, I was talking to, to Ethan for the book, um, and he told me that uh, before they, they kind of, the, those chicken strips got popular and before they, they commercialized them and decided to, to start selling them at a large scale, um, he had a taste test with the, I think, the electrician of their office. And he was just a, a very normal guy, average Joe, um, and, and fed him these and, and fed him some, unfortunately, animal-based chicken strips. I mean, he couldn't tell the difference. And, and that was kind of the huge step. Um, of course, these also are still expensive. And I think this is partly why these technologies though they're growing extremely rapidly, haven't displaced animal products yet, um, is because they're expensive. And some consumers can tell the difference. Um, if you had a blinded survey of, of you know, a few dozen people, I don't think you'd quite get to the point of, of um, indistinguishability yet, but they're pretty close. Um, if you ask people in the field where they are now, they'll say something like 70% uh, or, or upwards of 90% for some products. Um, actually, white meat, so, so chicken meat, is, is, is much easier to produce in this method because it doesn't have the vasculature and the blood cells of red meat. Um, and it doesn't have heme. So heme is that magical ingredient in the Impossible Burger. It's controversial among animal rights activists because um, to get grass, which is a, kind of a food certification in the United States, you basically have to do animal testing. Um, so they did that to, to, to be able to use that product in the market. Of course, they're not doing it anymore, and they were very hesitant to do it and really felt that they had to. Um, but if you're making something that's a white meat, um, you actually don't need that at all uh, because you don't need the vasculature. In fact, if you add heme, that kind of magic ingredient, to um, the, the flesh of a chicken, um, it will taste like the flesh of a cow. It'll taste like beef. Um, pretty magical. You also have people like David Young um, in the market. So uh, while David hasn't, mostly hasn't worked on technology himself, um, he's worked on bringing these products to new markets. So in particular, Hong Kong. Um, he grew up in Hong Kong, went to New York, um, and is now using those connections in both East and West uh, to help bridge the gap, be a conduit um, between the, the, the two food systems. And you know there's such a demand for plant-based food and such a tradition of plant-based food in Hong Kong um, because of things like tofu and, and uh, soy products and all of that. Um, the estimated number of residents who are vegetarian at least one day a week in Hong Kong has increased from 5% in 2008 to 23% in 2014. The number of vegetarian restaurants increased from 140 in 2013 to 240 in 2016. So Hong Kong, you're really getting um, some huge changes happening. In fact, um, David is, is rapidly expanding his, his work. So he has a storefront now called Green Common that's uh, selling actually products like the Beyond Burger and, and well, the Impossible Burgers in Hong Kong, though, though, though not at Green Common right now. Um, he's also now making his own products catered specifically towards the East Asian market. So um, his company, Right Treat, is uh, kind of now testing out and releasing their first product, Omnipork. Um, so I actually got to try it a few weeks ago when I was in Hong Kong giving a talk on the end of animal farming. Um, and it really does taste like the um, you know, pork ball you might get at a uh, Chinese restaurant. Um, it's made with pea protein, uh, soy, shiitake mushrooms, and rice. Um, it's being tested by chefs who can prepare it and test it and kind of get a proof of concept that they can um, provide you know, vegan uh, dim sum, which is you know, a huge part of the kind of weekly family traditions in Hong Kong. Um, so a huge driver of success and a huge sign of success for all this plant-based food technology is the interest from investors. Um, they're tripping over each other to be the ones who get to invest in these new products and these new companies. Um, in fact, you have people from the meat industry itself, um, like uh, Tom Hayes, the CEO of Tyson Foods, which is the world's second largest meat processor, who said plant protein is growing faster than animal protein. For us, we want to be where the consumer is. And you know, when I talk about the economics of, of, of veganism and the economics of creating a vegan food system, it's way, way, way easier to take the meat companies who are really protein companies. You know, they're not farming the animals themselves. They're instead you know, meat processors and, and distributors and, and branders and just give them plant-based protein, uh, give them you know, the, the results of these technology and allow them to pivot their company towards a more sustainable, a more efficient, a more prosperous model. Um, and they can get really excited about that. We don't have to build a, a trillion dollar industry from scratch, which is just an insane endeavor um, and is kind of a, the most difficult way you could think of uh, to build a vegan world. 
Bill Gates um, called this the future of food. In fact, he said that um, around, I think, 2014, when just these chicken strips were coming out by Beyond Meat. Um, it, we didn't have the Impossible Burger or the Beyond Burger or those really exciting new products, and he was already saying it was the future of food. Um, this, I used to live in San Francisco in the United States, and this is really the talk of the town. It's one of the hottest tech trends. And these people have so much money and so much influence over society that if we can get them on board with, with this food and get them on board with veganism and animal rights, it's just a huge, huge tool in our arsenal. Finally, Richard Branson, um, founder of uh, the Virgin Empire, um, said, I believe that in 30 years or so, we will no longer need to kill any animals and that all meat will either be clean or plant-based, taste the same, and also be much healthier for everyone. So this is a really powerful statement. He's not just saying he supports these or the, the future, but he's saying that in 30 years, we're going to have essentially a vegan food system, or I mean, he's talking about meat, but supposedly, you know, he's probably thinking about dairy and, and eggs and other products as well. You know, leather is, is being produced with these technologies as well and other animal products. Um, so this is hugely compelling to me. Um, my timeline is maybe a bit more pessimistic uh, based on what I've learned from previous social movements and technologies, um, but I'm glad he's so excited and I'm glad that he's investing in these companies. So uh, you might have noticed that he mentioned something called clean meat. Uh, clean meat is, a, is not a plant-based product, it's an, it's an animal cell-based product. Um, so you might have heard it called lab-grown meat, um, that's a very off-putting and actually a misleading name, so I try not to use it. Um, but basically you take a small sample of animal cells um, from, from a living animal that could be at a sanctuary, um, and you take those cells today, and then for the next hundred years you can use those cells in, in cell culture and media and grow them and grow real animal tissue um, or grow other animal products. Um, and uh, feed them you know, sugar, nutrients, all the things that they would get inside an animal's body. You're just taking the meat and disassociating it from the animal. So right now a big part of why we don't care about animals is because we think of them as meat. We, we objectify them in that sense. And if you can just disassociate those two things and, and tell people and show people that meat doesn't have to come from animals, um, then that can really be a huge change in not just the food system but in human psychology and in the moral circle in the long run. Um, you then you know, have these cells and, and they're all in this big um, tank. So, so this is actually a beer brewery. There are no large scale production uh, facilities for clean meat right now, um, but it's a very similar process. Um, and then you, you take them and, and uh, you extract them and make them into a hamburger patty or something like that. It's a bit more difficult and the technology doesn't have the capacity to create actual 3D tissue yet like a T-bone steak or, or like a chicken breast. Um, but given you know, ground meat is, is such a huge part of the market and especially such a huge part of the, the factory farming market, um, this is a, a really important first step. And actually what I was saying earlier about um, white meat um, is also true for this. It's easier to produce um, meat from, from chickens or other birds than it is to produce um, red meat from, from ruminants. In fact, uh, fish meat is, is even easier to produce um, because, for example, um, the cells can be grown at room temperature instead of having to keep them warm the way they're kept warm inside of an animal's body. Um, and I'm happy to answer more questions about this technology in Q&A. Um, this is kind of the four steps of the process. I know people have a lot of animal rights ethical concerns with this. For example, the use of uh, fetal bovine serum, um, you know, the, the blood of, of baby cows, essentially. Um, but that's actually a pretty big misconception. So that's a, a research tool in the biomedical community right now. Um, but it's only useful at very small scales for their purposes. Um, it's very expensive. It's very inconsistent. Um, so there's essentially zero chance, just economically, ignoring the ethics, that it will ever make it into to commercial commercial clean meat products. Um, similarly, with taking the cells from an animal, um, basically the only, again, economical way to do this is to take those cells and, and uh, what's called create a continuous cell line. So you're just getting the cells from the uh, tank, from, from the, the culture you have going, and you don't have to keep sampling them from animals. And of course, even if you do want to sample them from animals today, you can do that from a sanctuary. In fact, you can do that from a chicken feather. Um, so that's how they, uh, one of the leading companies in this field produced their, their first prototype. So to give one quick example um, of the huge power of technology here, consider just one company, uh, Google. So Google, um, Google's co-founder, Sergey Brin, was the funder of the world's first uh, cultured, clean, lab-grown hamburger in 2013. Um, a few years later, Google tried to buy Impossible Foods um, before they had even brought a product to market um, because they were so compelled by this technology and Impossible Foods said, no, you know, we know the potential of this. Um, we're actually not going to sell it because they were so excited about the technology. 
Um, I've been to Google's cafeterias in, in Mountain View, California, and they're serving a lot of the newest plant-based products to their employees. And they have a huge uh, vegan and animal rights community there. People like uh, Matthew Dimsky, who's a Google employee, but is, is, is speaking out on behalf of a more sustainable, uh, more ethical food system. Um, and you get this internal change that's happening in these Silicon Valley companies where they're pushing really from the ground up for big changes. So you might have also heard that WeWork, which provides uh, co-working spaces for people, um, they uh, created essentially a meat-free policy as a company. So if, if employees are traveling, for example, um, they can't purchase um, meat products um, with, with the company's money. Um, so it's really huge and a really big part of this change. Um, finally, so, so this guy, Eric Schmidt, who's um, the chairman of Alphabet, which is Google's parent company, he said um, when he was asked, what are the biggest tech trends, I think in 2016, um, that the biggest one was nerds over cattle, and it was this food trend. And again, this is the hot topic of Silicon Valley, and it's really exciting for, for the growth of the vegan movement. So uh, that's a whole lot about technology, um, but with the rest of this presentation, I wanna go through a little roadmap for how I see this technology and, and social change leading us to an animal-free food system. So it's in four stages. Um, I think by 2100, um, we'll have a global animal-free food system. Uh, it's funny because when I give this talk to the public, I have to explain why that's so short. Um, but when I give it to animal rights activists, I have to explain why this is so long. <laughs> so one of the reasons it's so long is that um, this is considering even places like Sub-Saharan Africa, where right now there's a lot of poverty and people are unable to um, kind of choose what they eat, essentially, whether that's choosing a more meat-based diet or choosing a more plant-based diet. They have to kind of take what they can get. And I think over the next century, we're going to see a lot of um, rising incomes, um, and that's going to empower them to make um, food decisions that they can't currently make. Um, so that's part of why it will take so long. I think in high-income countries like Luxembourg or the United States um, or most of Europe, um, we'll get a lot further along a lot more quickly. So to go back to effective altruism briefly, um, which again is my perspective, um, it has a few important implications for this. So first is that um, we need to estimate, we need to throw out numbers. Um, if you talk to me around the conference, you'll notice I like make up numbers all the time um, because that's really important for, for kind of quantifying and specifying our beliefs, even if we're deeply uncertain. You know, I don't claim to have a, a crystal ball or anything. I'm not predicting the future with much confidence here, but we need to be thinking in the long term about our movement because if we're too focused on you know, what's happening tomorrow or what's happening in the next six months, um, we'll shoot ourselves in the foot. We'll, for example, you know, try to get a lot of attention by being provocative and controversial and harm our reputation as a movement. Or we'll create a bunch of people eating you know, plant-based foods but who aren't really becoming activists or who aren't founding companies or who aren't uh, going vegan. Um, and, and that could be less important for the long run growth, which given how many animals are used in the food system and how important it is that we eventually end animal exploitation, we really do need to keep a very long term perspective. Um, so also this is a realistic timeline, uh, not the ideal one, kind of what I mentioned earlier. Um, I don't have time to go into detail on kind of all the reasons for choosing this timeline, um, but to give you some examples, so um, for human rights, it's taken centuries um, to get uh, people of color and, and women uh, viewed as what we call legal persons and not legal property like animals are thought of right now. Um, but if we look at technological change, that can be much, much faster. So in the United States, uh, with, with the advent of automobiles, it took around 30 years from the first commercial production for there to be more cars than horses in the United States. Um, if you get more recent uh, to more of a globalized, more of an efficient economy, um, with personal computers, for example, uh, it took 20 years for the majority of US households to own those. Uh, even more recently with smartphones, it took around five years to go to a majority of the US population owning smartphones. So with the power of technology, we can get really rapid changes, um, both in you know, personal benefit, but also in you know, the expansion of humanity's moral circle. So if we think about what big changes that have happened for animals, a lot of them have come through automobiles replacing horses, or petroleum replacing whale oil and lamps, or uh, virtual reality replacing the use of animals for entertainment. It can be a hugely, hugely powerful tool if we want to create change quickly, and we don't want to wait centuries um, for a vegan world. So um, as I mentioned earlier with Richard Branson, many of the people in this field have more optimistic timelines than, than I do. Um, in fact, Pat Brown at Impossible Foods has estimated that his company alone, um, or at least as a big driver, will um, replace all meat by 2035. Um, Richard Branson's was 2048. Um, ProVeg uh, hopes for a 50% reduction by 2040. Greenpeace hopes for a 50% reduction of meat and dairy um, by 2050. 
Um, and of course, you might know that many intellectuals, even outside the field of animal rights, have predicted at least that we'll eventually get to the end of animal farming. People like um, journalist Ezra Klein, the author Steven Pinker, um, science educator Bill Nye, um, Indian politician Maneka Gandhi, um, and the late conservative columnist uh, Charles Krauthammer. Um, so I've tried to strike a balance in my own timeline, um, and I hope you find it at least interesting. So I think right now we're in the foundation stage of the movement. Um, I think this will last until around um, 2025. So it involves a lot of uh, welfare reforms. A lot of what we've seen creating big changes in the movement so far has been ending the worst abuses of animal exploitation, you know, especially in, in the food system. Um, this is uh, important, but to an animal rights audience, I of course have to, you're all aware that this is insufficient. Um, and there are a lot of challenges with it. But the reason I, I put it here and I put it first in my timeline is it's a huge builder of momentum and capacity. So again, with the effect of altruism perspective, we need to be focused on the very long term, not just thinking about reducing suffering, but how do we build uh, nonprofit organizations? How do we build companies? How do we build conferences? How do we build groups of people who can sustain themselves and see victories year after year? And a big part of that is, is mitigating some of the worst harms. We're gonna see a lot of technological development um, for the next seven years or so. So a really important part of this is that um, it's happening behind the scenes. So while we see prototypes of these products, or you know, the Impossible Burger gets out to a few restaurants, for example, um, it's not huge sweeping changes in our food system yet. It's certainly not, let's say, over 5% of, of animal food production. Um, but it's supported by public sentiment, by investor interest, and, and it is a social process. Um, but what's happening most here is just kind of perfecting those technologies. I mentioned 70% to 90% earlier, getting them all the way up to you know, 98, 99, 100% similarity, or even making them better than a lot of animal products, because you know, most of the animal products people are eating are you know, fast food burgers and whatnot, and with the, the potential of plant-based and, and clean meat technology, we can give them, of, of course, healthier food. Um, we can give them even tastier food and higher quality food. So um, this also includes regulation. Uh, if you've kept up with this technology at all, you'll know that there's been a big debate in the United States recently over which regulatory agency is going to um, advise and, and inculcate this, this new industry. Um, we have two, the Food and Drug Administration and the US Department of Agriculture. Um, fortunately, it's leaning towards the Food and Drug Administration, which is a consumer-oriented organization um, that regulates food sa safety basically on behalf of consumers, or at least that's its government mandate. Whereas the US Department of Agriculture um, is there to support the agricultural industry, which currently is, is largely an animal-based industry. Um, so it would be challenging for them to at least be the main one regulating this process. Um, and we're forming a lot of the, the regulatory structure right now, even though these products aren't on the market. And it seems to happen in a lot of different countries. Um, you know, with the European Union, for example, a big challenge is whether this technology gets condemned as unnatural or gross or it gets put in the same category as GMOs and these sorts of things, or whether it's seen as an ethical, as a moral um, development. And you know, that's a big thing I talk about when I, when I give these sorts of presentations to people in the industry, is that it needs to be a moral movement. You know, I mentioned at Sentience Institute, we study a lot of history. Um, one of our case studies was on uh, the advent of GMOs and, and why they largely failed to be adopted. And a big part of that was the industry pushing them forward and leaving ethics off the table and just saying, okay, we're gonna make this really efficiently, we're gonna make a lot of money. We know, you know, I mean, at least the scientists thought that it would solve a lot of the world's most pressing food issues, but to consumers, it was kind of just being thrown at their faces by these big, dark, scary, you know, mega corporations like Monsanto. Um, and we want to avoid that fate. You know, we want to see this as a ethically driven, not just animal rights, but sustainability and public health driven technology because that helps us win in the public dialogue. If you have you know, corporations, even if they're startups, against um, you know, ethical, let's say, farmers or, or environmental groups who oppose these technologies because they see them as unnatural, that's just a losing battle. You're never gonna win that public fight. Whereas if we see it as you know, the animal rights and the, the environmental and the public health communities coming together to support these technologies, that's a battle we can win. That's a battle we will win. So that's very, very exciting, um, but it's important for this stage. We're also gonna see the seeds of the public conversation. So this is something I really have to stress with, with animal rights advocates, is that we, we face a lot of danger and, and kind of the precedent we're setting for the upcoming food revolution. Um, so for example, I really think we should avoid gimmicks. Um, gimmicks are broadly seeking attention at the cost of reputation. 
So the, the biggest one, I'll give you some examples, is sex cells. Um, so the objectification of women using um, sexualized uh, billboards, sexualized online ads um, to promote veganism. This is very, very dangerous. Um, so again, a lot of the movement, a lot of any social movement is very short-term driven. People want clicks, people want the biggest short-term changes, um, but this puts us in huge danger of, of antagonizing other social movements. I mean, lots of people have stressed this this weekend, so I, I won't belabor it, um, but antagonizing social movements, making us see, be seen as, as um, a movement that's only for a specific part of the population, both within uh, you know, Europe and the United States, certain demographics like upper class, liberal, hippies, um, but also uh, worldwide, you know, being seen as a white or a Western movement and having trouble you know, um, spreading to, to the, the Chinese market, for example, where factory farming can not just you know, harm animals in that country, but of course harm their local um, economies, their local land, their local water, um, and their, their health, of course. So um, the last step of, of the foundation, or the last key component of it, I think is trigger events. Um, these are really important, and again, all social movements. Um, they capture the public's imagination. They're big events like books. So the book Eating Animals um, in the United States really set the stage for the discussion of, of vegetarianism and for uh, a growing population of vegetarians. Um, they can also be undercover investigations. You know, when I point to what's had the biggest impact in the animal rights movement so far, I think it's been undercover investigations because these have created a what we, what we would call rhetorical ammunition in society. So this is something you can bring up with people. If you're, for example, leafleting on the street, you can say, oh, you've seen those investigations, right? You've seen that horrific animal cruelty. And they say, oh, yeah, I saw a video of that on, on Facebook. Or I saw you know, a TV report on an undercover investigation. And immediately, you've just went through so many steps. You know, In the US movement now, we don't have to spend much time explaining to people that there is horrific cruelty in the food system. Instead, we have to tackle more practical challenges, like how do you get protein? And, and while that sucks, and it, it's, it's annoying to talk about, of course, um, um, it's a big step forward from the moral discussion, and we're, we're, we've stepped beyond that to a large extent due to these undercover investigations. So by 2025, uh, we're going to have a lot of momentum. A lot of these things are capacity building and getting us ready for an animal-free food revolution. So I think sometime in the next 10 years or so, um, we're going to, to get um, going for it extremely rapidly. Uh, and I would call that the revolution stage, kind of stage two of the movement. Um, I just you know, sang the, sung the praises of welfare reforms, and I am a big fan of, of focusing on those right now, um, but they will fail. Um, as people in this room know, anytime you're using animals, anytime you're exploiting animals, you're going to get cruelty. You're going to get these ethical issues um, because you're just viewing them as property. You're using them as raw materials and means to an end. Um, so we're not gonna be able to build what people think of as a humane or ethical food system using animals, um, but we have to show people that. Most people aren't as thoughtful or aware or uh, well-researched or ethically motivated as the people in this room, they have to see an attempt. They have to see that if you create a cage-free farm, you still get cruelty. Um, and to, to, to show them that, we have to um, pass measures to get cage-free farms and, and those sorts of things. Um, we'll even get attempted bans on factory farming. So this is happening now in, in Switzerland with, with sentience politics. Um, and it's going to happen in other countries. Some of these will fail, of course, but some of them will succeed. And if you're trying to ban all factory farming, all industrial use of animals, that, that treats them as property instead of as sentient beings, um, you will, if you get even close to succeeding, raise the price of animal products many times over. You know, you'll need an army of veterinarians and um, an army of inspectors to, to, to uh, keep watch over that food system. And it's just not going to be sustain sustainable. We need to show people that. Um, this is, again, another thing we, we see a lot of in history. So if you look at a movement like uh, British anti-slavery, at first they tried to reform slavery because everyone was saying, oh, sure, yeah, we shouldn't mistreat those slaves, um, but we should uh, just reform it. We don't need to abolish slavery. So they attempted that, and they showed people that it was an incorrigible institution. And that led to the momentum that led to you know, the 1807 ban on the slave trade, uh, which again was a moderate step that they used in that movement. And then in the 1830s, um, you know, the beginnings of, of bans on the entire uh, institution of slavery. We're going to see a lot of climate change urgency here. So this is you know, not something driven by activists, obviously, but it will provide a lot of incentive, a lot of self-interest for society. You know, most people are selfish and care more about what's happening to the climate you know, when it's causing natural disasters and they're feeling warmer summers than they do about, about animal issues or global poverty issues or any of that. Um, so this will provide uh, an impetus you know, as people see the, the climate impact of animal agriculture, and it will really, really speed up the movement. 
We're gonna see early adopters and an early majority at this stage. Uh, some of you might be familiar with this curve, um, the diffusion of innovations. Uh, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not concrete or, or, or proven or anything, but it's a useful framework for thinking about the different parts of the population and how they adopt new technologies or new social trends. So right now we're definitely innovators. You know, the people in this room are weird. Um, we're, we're extremely strange people. We're very ethically minded. You know, most people, if you look at a ranking of, uh, you know, what they look for in food labels, ethics and sustainability and anything like that is the bottom. The top is fresh, the top is um, tasty, the top is um, cheap, uh, those sorts of things. And uh, as these technologies grow and as the movement gains power, we're gonna be able to start influencing those people and at least the ones who are somewhat ethically motivated we're gonna start creating big changes in the more selfish part of society. Of course, the people at the far end are the people who just aren't gonna change um, by essentially any direct conversion means. You know, they won't pay extra, for example, for these products. We're gonna to have to get them through other means that I'll, I'll talk about later. Um, we're gonna see really radical mainstream discussions. So as people's behaviors are changing, that's gonna cause their attitudes to change. It's gonna reduce that cognitive dissonance people feel when they're eating animals three times a day. And this gets into a really powerful cycle because that attitude change then feels more behavior change, behavior change, attitude change, and back and forth. And that's why I'm saying change is gonna happen so quickly in this part of the movement, or in this part of the timeline. Uh, we're gonna see institutional rhetoric here, which is the last thing I wanna go into detail on. Um, so by this, I mean uh, a change in the discourse. So we'll talk more about ending animal farming. We'll talk more about society needs to eat more plant-based foods. Um, we'll be doing more policy change, more movement building, instead of a lot of the stuff we focused on historically, like I talked about earlier with go vegan messaging or you need to eat more plant-based, go reducitarian, um, veg-focused leaflets or veg-focused online ads. Um, I think this will be really, really effective. This is actually, in fact, the strongest evidence-based conclusion uh, you can draw from the history of social movements and, and social psychology. Um, historical precedent, for example. So I know of virtually no movement where they've succeeded with a heavy focus on individual change that we see in the farmed animal movement. Um, when they've attempted it in cases like the free produce movement and anti-slavery or uh, what's called green consumerism in the environmental movement with a heavy focus on recycling or eco-friendly light bulbs, uh, mostly those movements have come to realize that those tactics were not the most effective and they've pivoted towards policy change towards institutional change and saw much greater results. Um, second, institutional change evokes moral outrage. So we're all familiar with the defensiveness that we encounter when we try to get somebody to change their own diet. You know, even someone like me who doesn't talk much at all about veganism, I talk about ending animal farming, I still get many people who, who just get resistance because they think I'm trying to change their own diet. And they just build up an impenetrable wall and will come up with every reason, you know, start talking about why, um, oh, I can't, I'm an athlete, so I need protein. And if you explain why there's protein in animal-based foods, they'll talk about B12 or creatine or something. And they'll just pull up any excuse that they can find. It seems like there's an endless uh, you know, stack of them that they're pulling from. And really, if, if you talk to these people for a long time, maybe they'll give up eventually, but usually they'll come up with some excuse. So, um, for example, because I think a lot about animal consciousness, I hear a lot of um, people saying, oh, animals aren't conscious, because consciousness is such a um, vague concept that you can basically argue against it. Um, you can even argue against the consciousness of other humans um, ad infinitum, because you can't really prove consciousness in the way you can prove things like protein and plant foods. Um, and I just don't think we're going to ever make big changes by the one-by-one -one conversion of people to plant-based diets. Instead, we have to rally them together towards a collective cause where they're able to feel moral outrage. They're able to get pissed off and angry at the food system, at society as a whole, at animal abuse, instead of at themselves, which, which people don't do. This, this emotion, moral outrage, which is really important in social movements, is never directed at oneself. It's, it's just essentially impossible. And of course, social pressure. You know, the biggest finding from, from probably Psycholo the psychology of persuasion as a whole, is that people are extremely influenced by their peers um, and by authorities. Um, we're, we're social creatures, and if you talk about something as a collective movement, you talk about trends, you talk about society changing together, that is far, far more powerful than any logical, individual, rational argument you can provide them. So at this point, we're gonna have the meteries of, of 2050. I think by 2050, we'll have the majority of meat, dairy, and eggs in high income countries be animal free, either plant-based or, or clean. Um, and that's very, very exciting. And it's kind of, we've succeeded mostly as a movement and for the next 50 years, it's going to be kind of ending uh, the rest of animal farming and, and, and the rest of our food system and, and the rest of the world. 
So um, again, we're, we're kind of cruising at this point, um, going through stages like stigmatization. So this is the late majority driven by momentum, uh, things like labeling and default options. Um, again, social pressure. That's how we get the, the selfish part of the population that's hardly at all ethically motivated. Uh, we're going to have some challenges of globalization. This is tricky because we might have some uh, conflict, so actually the large-scale conflict between different countries. You know, if one's adopting animal-free food, but the other is trying to sell them animal products, you can get trade wars, um, like kind of what's going on right now with the United States. Um, and this could be another kind of failure mode of the movement. I mean, I think mostly we're going to struggle at, at this stage before 2025, um, but we might have another struggle at this stage as we attempt to globalize, um, as we encounter issues like um, if people perceive animal rights as, as a white person thing, you know, if we're antagonizing, let's say, East Asian cultures again um, by condemning the dog meat trade when we're abusing you know, pigs and, and, and fish and chickens uh, just as much, if not more. Uh, we'll see that reduction in cognitive dissonance that, again, is fueling cyclical change. And then in the final stage, follow through, we're going to see a full globalization. We're going to see all countries adopting animal-free food system. Um, we're going to see mainstream anti-speciesism, anti discussion of personhood, um, bans on animal exploitation as a whole, kind of the, the, the vegan world we're all imagining at this stage. Um, we're going to see celebration. And of course, sanctuaries are going to become very popular as people feel a collective guilt, as people are more aware of animals as individuals. Um, they're going to want to take care of them and, and provide some uh, relief for you know, these animals that we've abused together as a society for so long. Um, and this will be kind of where we, as activists, you know, those of us who are I guess, still alive, um, will really get to celebrate and retire. You know, if you're part of the movement at this stage, um, please take the rest of your life off. Um, you don't need to keep working. You know, at this point, there are going to be so few animals being used for food. Um, those being used will probably be on what are thought of as maybe humane farms or smaller farms, kind of as artisan products, um, which will eventually be stamped out because we will take that anti-speciesist perspective. Um, but that will be kind of what lingers. Um, so uh, these chickens who you saw at the beginning of the talk are actually my two chickens at home in, in New York City. Um, when I think of this final stage of the movement and I think of the end of animal farming, I think of them. Uh, you know, they were both raised on, on uh, battery cage farms in California, but now they live on implants, for example, so they don't have the overactive reproductive system and egg production that causes so many health issues um, because they're receiving, it's essentially what uh, humans have in birth control to keep them from laying those eggs um, and just building a better world for these animals, at least those animals who are still around. Um, very briefly, I want to go through um, and just mention the next frontiers. So after we end animal farming, we need to keep our eye to, to the distant future. Um, we need to not stop you know, as, as a society, and we never do. You know, after we expand the moral circle to a certain human population, we keep going, we reach animals. And at this stage, we're going to be thinking about you know, these really uh, distant, far future frontiers, like artificial sentience, you know, the possibility to create factory farming in computers or something, which is you know, pretty sci-fi and crazy to think about. But when you think about how many of these uh, sentient beings there could be, maybe people in the future will think of us who, who neglected these issues the way we think of people in the 1800s who weren't thinking at all about animal rights and were just thinking about human issues. So I hope that while we mostly focus on um, history and we focus on today and what we can accomplish, that we keep an eye towards the distant future and building a wide moral circle that reaches all sentient beings. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Leave in the comments below whether you think social change or food technology will be more important in building an animal-free food system. And always remember to like this video and subscribe to this channel.